He was one of the most controversial of Hollywood's stars. One of the most critically praised film directors of all time. Movie studios nevertheless distrusted him. As an actor, he was much in demand for his unusual characterizations. He was the one and only Orson Welles. He was born George Orson Welles in Kenosha, Wisconsin, May 16, 1915. Having been a child prodigy, he tried to make a living as an artist, but turned to acting. He made his Broadway debut as Tybalt in Romeo and Juliet. From the very first, he revealed his daring and audacity on the stage. Actor John Hausman collaborated with Wells in controversial staging of Shakespearean plays. This included their Mercury Players version of Julius Caesar, set in fascist Italy, and a voodoo version of Macbeth, featuring an all-black cast. Next, Wells moved to radio and set about to expand the medium to new dramatic effect. His rich voice proved perfect for radio and perfect for the voice of the crime thriller character, The Shadow. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> In the most infamous use of the radio medium, Wells' version of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds presented listeners with a series of radio news bulletins, creating a panic among those who thought the invasion from Mars was real. Wait a minute, something's happening. The creatures in the rocket cylinder at Grover's Mill. I can give you no authoritative information either as to their nature, their origin, or their purposes here on Earth. They had people running into ditches by the roadside and whatever, looking at the radio to see if something was going to come out of it after them. Were you aware of terror at the time you were giving this role? Were you aware that terror was going on throughout oh, the nation? Oh, no, of course not. I was, uh, frankly, terribly shocked to learn that, that uh, it did. Seeking to capitalize on Wells' notoriety, the Hollywood movie studio RKO offered him a deal unheard of for one who never made a feature movie before. RKO hired Wells to produce, direct, write, and star in two films. Included in the arrangement was a percentage of the profits and complete artistic freedom. Many seasoned directors were never offered deals like this. After considering several projects, Wells settled on a script for Citizen Kane. Orson asked me if I would go back just for now and work with Herman Mankiewicz, who had this idea uh, that they'd worked on together about a newspaper tycoon. Herman had broken his leg in a motor accident, and so we shipped him off to Victorville. I went with him, and we lived in Victorville for almost three months and came out with this 240-page script, which was the, the basis of Citizen Kane. I mean, this argument has become so boring that I hate even to talk about it. But, I mean, it, it is a fact that the basic idea of that script was Herman Mankiewicz. It, Orson being a very creative man, a genius, and a great director, obviously greatly influenced the final form of that script, so that the argument has really become idiotic. It was Orson's picture, and that's all there is to it. Herman Mankiewicz wrote the script on which the picture was based. For the release of the movie, Wells made a trailer as audacious in style as the feature film. Mike? Give me a mic. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Orson Welles. I'm speaking for the Mercury Theater, and what follows is supposed to advertise our first motion picture. Citizen Kane is the title, and we hope it can correctly be called a coming attraction. 
It's certainly coming, coming to this theater. And I think our Mercury actors make it an attraction. I'd like you to meet them. Speaking of attractions, well, the chorus girls are certainly an attraction. But frankly, ladies and gentlemen, we're just showing you the chorus girls for purposes of ballyhoo. It's a pretty nice ballyhoo. But here are some of our real Mercury people. This is the first time you've seen most of them on the screen. Hey, uh, give Joe a little light. Thanks. Now smile for the folks, Joe. Smile. Joseph Cotton, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Joseph Cotton, I think you're going to see a lot of him. Here's Ruth Warwick, whom I know you love. Ruth, there's the camera, Ruth. <laughs> we caught Ruth with her hair up. And here's somebody you've all heard on the radio, so I don't have to tell you he's wonderful, Ray Collins. Dorothy Comengore is a name I'm going to repeat. Dorothy Comengore. I won't have to repeat it much longer. You'll be repeating it. And here's George Kouluris, who's a grand actor. I'll say that name again. George Kouluris. Watch it. Here comes Everett Sloan. Look out, Everett. Oops. Everett Sloan, ladies and gentlemen. He isn't necessarily a comedian. And here's one of the best actors in the world, Agnes Moorhead. I've said a lot of nice things, but Erskine Sanford deserves some more. Erskine, Erskine Sanford. So does Paul. Paul, Paul Stewart, everybody. Citizen Kane is a modern American story about a man called Kane, Charles Foster Kane. I don't know how to tell you about him. There's so many things to say. I'll turn you over instead to the characters in the picture. As you'll see, they feel very strongly on the subject. Charles Foster Kane is... Um, um, sure, he started the war. But do you think if it hadn't been for Mr. Kane, the United States would have the Panama Canal? Charles Foster Kane is nothing more or less than a communist! Kane, governor. Listen, when the voters of this state and Mrs. Kane learn what I found out about Mr. Kane and a certain little blondie named Susan Alexander, he couldn't be elected dog catcher. I'm going to skin Mr. Charles Foster Kane alive. I'm going to marry him next week. At the White House. Emily, I hear you've been stepping out with Charlie Kane. I... Of course I love him. I gave him $60 million. Well, of course I love him. He's the richest man in America. Oh, but all the girls say about him at first. But you know, I can't help but admire him. He's crazy. He's wonderful. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you'll think about Mr. Kane. I can't imagine. You see, I play the part myself. Well, Kane is a hero and a scoundrel, a no account and a swell guy, a great lover, a great American citizen, and a dirty dog. It depends on who's talking about him. What's the real truth about Charles Foster Kane? I wish you'd come to this theater when Citizen Kane plays here and decide for yourself. <laughs> The movie mostly drew inspiration from the life of newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst. When Hearst found out, he used the influence of his media empire to crush the film's release. Although praised by critics, Citizen Kane did poorly at the box office. Citizen Kane was nominated for Best Picture and Screenplay, and Wells for Best Actor and Director. But the only Oscar Wells received that night, he shared with Herman Mankiewicz for co-writing the screenplay. In 1998, the American Film Institute named Citizen Kane the best movie of all time. Wells' next project for RKO was The Magnificent Ambersons, based on Booth Tarkington's novel of turn-of-the-century America. In his absence, RKO severely cut the film, and Wells disowned the final result. Wells went to Brazil to shoot his next movie, a docudrama sponsored by both RKO and the United States government to shore up relations with Latin America. Wells contributed to the war effort by performing magic on USO tours. When Magnificent Ambersons died at the box office, RKO fired Wells and his company. The failure of his movies at the box office damaged Wells' reputation. From then on, he had to struggle to obtain financing for his film project. After the war, Wells starred and directed The Stranger. It told the tale of a Nazi war criminal hiding out in a small town in Connecticut. It's high, Franz. 
Meineke. We mustn't be seen talking together. Go back to the church, into the woods. Into the woods, you understand me. Follow the path. I'll meet you there. Citizens of Harper, they've come after you. The plain little ordinary people, the ones you've been laughing at, have Franz Kindler. Well, you can't fool them anymore. Oh, sure, you can kill me, Mary, half the people down there. But there's no escape. You had the world and it closed in on you till there was only Harper. That closed in on you and there was only this room. And this room, too, is closing in on you. It's not true, the things they say I did. It's all their idea. I followed orders. You gave the orders. I, I only did my duty. Don't send me back to them. I can't face them. I'm not a criminal. You are. In 1948, Wells directed The Lady from Shanghai. It starred Wells' wife, the glamorous Rita Hayworth, whom Wells had married to the chagrin of her studio, who preferred their leading lady to have remained single. But their marriage was on the rocks at the time of the film, and Hayworth filed for divorce immediately after the completion of filming. Wells began his Shakespeare film trilogy in 1948 with his version of Macbeth. Atmospheric and surreal, it turned Shakespeare's Scottish play into a film noir thriller. In 1952, Wells followed with his version of Othello, which won the Grand Prix at the Cannes Film Festival. Wells wrote and directed Mr. Arcaden, an acerbic account of a powerful man, similar in style to Citizen Kane. Now I'll make you a present of a real one. The great secret of my life. Come in. Well, how come you never let yourself be photographed, for instance? No, oh, I've been photographed, but usually I break the photograph. I'm also head of the photographer. I'm a strong man, Van Straten. How old do you think I am? How would I know? I don't know either. See, that's my secret. I don't know. You think I'm crazy? He financed his films partly with his acting appearances. Wells had a role in John Huston's version of Moby Dick. Houston also cast him in Roots of Heaven, with Wells as a pompous radio personality visiting Africa. Orson Wells as Cy Sedgwick, internationally famous television broadcaster. Leave that man alone. You got that straight, Your Excellency? I've been waiting all my life for somebody to spit on me. Now finally somebody's had the guts to do it, and you know what? Suddenly it gets to be almost bearable to be a man. Trevor Howard as Morell who fights a lone crusade to prevent the wholesale slaughter of the giant creatures he loves. Charlton Heston agreed to appear in Touch of Evil on the condition that Orson Welles not only act in the film, but also direct. Hold the legs. The result proved to be one of the finest masterpieces of film noir. Wells portrayed a corrupt border town cop who framed suspects, with Heston playing a Mexican police officer out to expose him. Starring this outstanding cast, Charlton Heston, Janet Lee, Orson Welles. What are you trying to do? We're trying to strap you in the electric chair, boy. Only the offbeat, original, creative powers of Orson Welles could bring you so suspenseful, so gripping, so different a drama of a struggle between titans. You framed that boy. Framed him! Although no longer called upon to direct by the studios, Wells found work around Hollywood as an actor in both starring and supporting roles. Ferry to Hong Kong paired Wells with Kurt Jurgens. You can sit down, huh? <laughs> The 
The Tartars was a typical European-made medieval spectacle, starring Wells as a Tartar warlord, battling Viking Victor Mature. No Viking will ever bend to your will, regardless of your threats. I will destroy you. You might destroy me, but you'll never destroy my people. Arundai, the master of malice, a powerful and fearsome portrayal by Orson Welles. Stand closer to the throne. Come here to me. Are you afraid? Viking women don't tremble at Tartar's words. Treasure Island, made in 1972, not only put Wells back into a starring role as pirate Long John Silver, but gave him a chance to contribute as a screenwriter. Now, Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island sets sail on a new voyage more excitingly told than ever before. Now, Treasure Island is Orson Welles as Long John Silver, the mutiny of the villainous crew. You're in a bad way. Ship lost, treasure lost, men lost. Your whole business has gone to wreck. And if you want to know who did it, it was I. And Orson Welles as Long John Silver. You stinking swabs! There's 700,000 pounds of buried gold right here. Welles continued producing and directing his own movies until near the end of his life, always hampered by lack of funding. F, for fake, was his take on fraud, profiling art forgery and other types of cons. It was hailed by critics, but scorned by Hollywood. Could this lady, if she wanted to, answer this question? Is there, or was there, a secret link between the world's richest painter and the world's richest man? Well, Picasso is the biggest phenomenon of our time. It never existed that a painter was able, with one movement of his hand, what necessarily didn't involve more than 10 seconds, that movement of the hand transformed in gold. Picasso's estate has been valued at over three quarters of a billion dollars. And the world's richest man? Who is he? Howard Hughes. You are the last! This week, as it must to all aviation's pioneers, the great heart of a welcoming nation went out to handsome, well-heeled hero Howard Hughes. Joseph Cotton. He first came to Hollywood to play Howard Hughes in a movie. I put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it. Then the director changed his mind and changed tycoons. This lady, does she know more than she's telling? Ladies and gentlemen. Or is she telling more than she knows? Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to provide a few words of explanation. <clears throat> now, how shall I begin? You're talking about movies. Begin with the director. You ought to do that. Modesty forbids. Oh? Oh. Well, we all know what the critics have said about the movie. Our movie coming soon to this theater? Delicious. Delirious. Delightful. Go on. I'm quoting the critics. They've acclaimed it as a cinematic... More than one movie director was involved in these proceedings. One of them was Mr. Howard Hughes. He really... He really was a movie director, once. And he really did play an important part in this movie. I'm sorry, before he died, that is. If he did die... And if, in fact... He was really Howard Hughes in the first place. Or any place. Was Mr. Hughes a vegetable? A spook? A gibbering lunatic? Was his hair down to his knees? Were his fingernails nine inches long? I photographed his ham sandwich. That's no lie. I really did. Why should anyone doubt you? Well, after we finished shooting this film, several of our leading characters have been doing time in Spanish, American, and Swiss, Swiss jails. Why should anyone believe any one of us? Exposed. A man who holds the art world to ransom. Oh. Mrs. Irving. Before she turned up at the Swiss bank disguised in a black wig. Then why do you want people to do fakes? Because the fakes are as good as the real ones, and there's a market, and there's a demand. If you didn't have an art market, then fakers could not exist. 
I know one thing. I never offered a painting or a drawing to a museum who didn't buy it. That never refused one. Never. Oh, yeah. They never caught her. She may never be charged formally with any of these crimes, but the media keeps on calling her the Hungarian Connection. Her real name is Oya Kodar. Or so she says. I made these photographs. And the movie. Yes, and I photographed the movie. You My real name is... Mention the title. My real name is Gary Graver. The title. F for fake. Good. Go on. Well... Who, for instance, gave her that tiger to begin with? Why is she mentioned in Howard Hughes' will? And how? And which will? There have been a lot of those wills, of course, but she has one of the best. She also had a grandfather who was the best forger in history. Yes, but she's a legitimate painter herself, though she never breathed a word of that to Picasso. <clears throat> the following commercial message, which is fairly brief and completely dishonest, concerns the advent soon on this same screen of the motion picture entitled F for Fake, which rips the veil of secrecy from a whole series of scandalous items. For instance, the 22 Picassos. Worth who knows how many millions. How did this young woman get her hands on them? Why did her grandfather soak them all in gasoline and burn them to ashes? People wonder why it was so difficult to get permission to show this film in America. They should remember that when Ephra Fake was playing to packed houses in the rest of the world, Howard Hughes was still alive. Supposedly. And if Coda was carrying on with Picasso in the south of France, how did Hughes who was busy at the time growing his toenails in Vancouver, make it to those secret meetings on the Mexican pyramid. And what about the tiger? Who is under that sheet? By what strange chain of circumstances did this savage beast move from Managua to a penthouse swimming pool in Beloit, Wisconsin? And who is this man? C.F. for fake, the movie that dares to ask that question. The uh, UFOs, Gary, we were going to mention, remember, that the unidentified flying objects only appeared after my radio broadcast. And what about that flying object? Ah. And here... Ladies and gentlemen, suppose I come right out with it and admit to you now that my old Martian hoax on the radio was... well, not exactly... A hoax. That there were secret sponsors of that broadcast who were, in fact, some rather influential beings from outer space. You smile. Ten seconds more, Orson. I think they're smiling, Gary, and I'd just like to remind them that it is since that broadcast that there have been in this country alone more than a hundred thousand authenticated sightings. You still think it's a joke? Good. That's the way we want you to feel about it. For now. We'd like to make this little commercial message as modest as possible. So we'll just say that critics all over the world have called it a masterpiece. Wells died in 1985, but his legacy as one of the most inventive and influential movie makers lives on. Hollywood will always remember Orson Welles. <laughs>